everyone. <clears throat> Honored and delighted that you all would, would show up for this. I've not done a lot of a lot of virtual programs like this, so this is kind of new for me. So, um, so we'll see if we can work out work through our technical difficulties. And um, and uh, since this uh, the organization that's sponsoring this is from Florida, the plants that I'm gonna I'm gonna lean towards southern plants. And um, and I should mention I have early stage of Parkinson's disease, and when I get excited, like when the idea of talking to a bunch of bunch of bunch of kindred spirits and interested folks. I tell you, I start, I start shivering a little bit. This, this left hand really wants to join the fun. And uh, so you just kind of bear with me on that. I think we'll be, we'll be fine here. So let's, let's maybe we'll go on to the first slide here and see what we can do. Let's see, come in, look up a little here. Oh, there we go. So there we go. We're gonna talk about Florida and interesting plants in the deep south, we need to talk about Spanish moss. Now, Spanish moss is not really a moss and it's not from Spain, but other than that, you can say it's well-named. <laughs> you know, it's actually, Spanish moss is actually a flowering plant in the pineapple family. And I'll show you, if it, about around May and June, if you're around Spanish moss, so let's see, so how do we get this to go? May and June, look in, look in the Spanish moss and you'll see it has these little, little greenish yellow flowers, little three petal flowers. And it's actually a flowering plant. And what's astounding about Spanish moss is that, it, is that it lives up there in the trees. And it's not a parasite. It lives completely, you see, sometimes you'll see it on fence posts or in telephone lines and it's living and it's doing just fine up there. And it makes all of its, gets all of its nutrients from just from the dust in the air and from the, from the rain from the sky, and it manages to grow. And it's sort of interesting when you think about it, when you look at it, it has these little, it's sort of gray colored. And that, that gray is actually waxy, waxy like shingles. And when it's, when it's been long, a long dry spell, those shingles cling real tight and um, cling tight to, the, to, the, to the, the vascular core in the center. And, um, and when it rains, then, then, then the, the the cells underneath them swell up and the little shingles lift up and actually turns green and, uh, and photosynthesizes. And if you're around Spanish moss, get some that's dry sometime and take it and put it, in, just, just dip it in a, in a bucket of water for just a few minutes and lift it out and watch. And sometimes it'll turn green right before your very eyes. It's really quite, quite astounding to, to see that. A couple of times, one time I was, had, a, had a program in Florida where I was working with some school kids. And I just went and got some Spanish moss in the in the yard, and I and I dipped it in the water for them, and it turned green right before their eyes, and they all applauded. And um, and the arts administrator said, "You poured water on moss," and they they applauded like it was a great trick. And I just remind them it's one of the miracles of nature, and it is truly a great trick. And um, so let's see what else we got here. Let's see. So you can imagine this is a, this is a picture of one of the Timucua Indian maidens, and um, and when the Spanish from one of the Spanish manuscripts, and they described they described it like this: the queen and her handmaidens wear a kind of moss that grows on trees falling from their shoulders. The moss is interlaced into delicate tresses which make chains of an azure blue. They are so pretty that one would say they were filaments of silk. So there you go. Can you imagine those Spanish clunking off their boats and then meeting, meeting the likes of likes of this 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 queen there to meet them? And uh, and you know you know people think tattooing and uh, thong bathing suits are kind of a modern thing. Well, you know it's been going on in Florida for a long time. Now what's interesting? Spanish moss when it when it's um when you look under Spanish moss when it kind of rots away, it leaves kind of a kind of a uh, very black vascular core. I'm going to just kind of just show it here a little bit on this picture. And you see this black stuff underneath the, underneath the Spanish moss. Well, it turns out this has, a, has a, had a lot of uses. For in the old days, it actually was spun up and made into kind of a twine that was used to, to, um, to line, line um, uh, to make saddle blankets and things like that. It makes like a twine. And then, um, and then, then it turns out in the, in the early part of the 1900s and up, up until, until maybe the 50s and 60s, 
there was actually a big Spanish moss industry. And what they would do is they would gather Spanish moss out of the trees, drag it, bring it to one of the, to, to, a, to a moss gin. They actually had moss gins in the same way they had cotton gins. And what they would do is they, they'd put it in big heaps out in the backyard, let it, let, it, let it compost until it was nothing but the black core. They run it through these combing machines and they had, then they had all this black, all this black material and it was used as upholstery stuffing. And for most, for, in the old days, the only upholstery stuffing they had was things like either horse hair or chicken feathers or things like that. And, um, and what, was, what was special about the Spanish moss is that it didn't attract moths or, or, or vermin of any kind because it's just basically inert. And, uh, and that was a big business. And actually I got to, I got to talk to the, to the owner of the last moss gin that was in Gainesville, Florida, the last moss gin in Florida. And he talked about how, how what, what put him out of business basically was, um, was foam, was, was the foam that's used for, for upholstery stuffing now. And he said that for a while they were actually selling it to um, fishery, to fish hatcheries because it would be a good place to deposit fish eggs. And they were using it as, as for steamships and battleships. They use it for their water filters. And uh, eventually it just kind of faded away. But it's sort of amazing to think about that. And sometimes, sometimes I've even been like in an old barn one time and I saw an old stuffed chair with some of the upholstery sticking out of it. And I looked and sure enough, actually I was up in Canada and there it was, Spanish moss. I could see that, see that inner core. They used to use that in um, Model T Ford seats too. So, okay, what else have we got here? Oh, now here I've been talking about Spanish moss and here now I'm showing you a picture of Scandinavia. I don't know if you recognize it, a little, little geographical review. There's Norway there on the left and there's Sweden, then there's Finland. Now what in the world has that got to do with Spanish moss? Well, well, it turns out that Linnaeus was down there in Stockholm, Sweden. He was in Sweden and he was classifying the plants back in the 1600s. And uh, he was classifying plants. He was getting plants shipped over from the new world. And he had a, had a, um, had a, a student or, or an associate that came to, wanted to come and study with him. He came over from Finland and they came across that Gulf of Bosnia. You see that big, that big body of water between, between Sweden and Finland. He came across on a boat to work with Linnaeus, and he got so seasick on that, on that trip across the, the Gulf that he swore that he would never go on a boat again. And actually, and he was good to his promise, because what he did is he walked all the way back around that whole Gulf of Bosnia, walked like it was a thousand kilometers, you know, rather than go back on the boat. Well, about then, Linnaeus got a shipment of plants from the New World, and in that, in that collection of plants was some Spanish moss. And, this, and, he, and it was the report, the notes on the, on the specimen said that, that it was um, that it was a plant that grew up in the trees. And so he thought, well, it, it doesn't like water. So he named it after, his, after this, this professor, this, this, this associate. The associate's name was Talans. And, uh, and so to this day, the Talansia is the scientific name of Spanish moss, Talansia usneoides. You can see that picture there on the on the right. That's a picture of Usnia. Usnia is a lichen, and it looks a lot like Spanish moss, doesn't it? And so it's usinoid. It looks like Usnia. So Talansia usinoides. And it's, you know, it's sort of funny, you know, because these scientific names they always sound they sound so stuffy and sort of sort of technical and and uh, very scientific. Well, and you start to realize that when you look at the story of how some of these plants got their names, it's really kind of hilarious. All from Mr. Talans, who, who, who hated water. Um, all right, now this is a little plant. When I, was, when I was a little boy, I was out in the backyard with my dad, and, um, and we saw this little three, this little, little three petal plant, three leaf plant. And he said, You know, you can eat that. That's called sour grass. And I tasted it, and whoa, it was sour. Had like this kind of this, this sort of delightful, tangy flavor. And um, well, I learned out later that, that sour grass is just kind of a common name for it because it's sour, but it's not a grass. It's, its proper name is wood sorrel or oxalis. And that, that acid that makes its taste so sour is, um, is, is called oxalic acid because it was first found in this plant. And, and it's the same thing that makes rhubarb taste sour. And you know, one time, 
I was walking in the woods with a Chippewa Cree Indian friend of mine. And, and um, he was raised up north and, and raised fairly traditionally. And I was really excited to be in the woods with him. And I was just asking him about plants. Well, we were in behind my cabin in North Carolina and, and he, he didn't really know many of the plants because he was from Saskatchewan and the plants weren't exactly the same. But sure enough, we came on some of this wood sorrel. And now there's wood sorrels, there's, there's dozens of species all over the Southeast. I mean, from Florida and, and then you can go all around, probably all around the world, but at least all around the country. And you can go out in the West under the web, redwood trees, there's a big redwood sorrel. You can go out in the desert and in, in between the sidewalks in San Diego and you can see, you can see little wood sorrels that grow out there. Lots of different species of them. Some have pink flowers, some have yellow, some have white. Well, I showed him that. I said, how about this plant? Do you know this one? He goes, oh yes. He said, I've gathered baskets full of that. I said, baskets full of that? What would you do with a basket full of wood sorrel? He said, well, if you're along the trail, and you're picking wild greens and you wanna make a salad out of those greens and you don't have any salad dressing, you take some of these leaves, they're sour, you chop them up and you mix them in with the salad greens. It's like you sprinkle vinegar on it. And, uh, and I said, oh, I see, yeah, I know it is sure sour tasting. He said, I said, what do you call this plant? And he said, well, we call it something, that's, we call it Kasiatawasoskia. Well, of course, my next question would be, how do you, how do you, how do you translate that? Yeah, well, you know, he'd never had to translate that before. And I could see him kind of working it out. Kasiatawaso, he says, means it's all there. He says, <laughs> he shrugs his shoulder and goes, wonder why we call it that? We go wander down the trail and, and um, a little while later he goes, oh, I know why we call it it's all there. We consider six to be a representation of completeness. The four directions, the six directions, north, south, east, and west. That's the six directions, north and south, east and east, north, north, south, east, west, sky, uh, uh, high and uh, above and below. And um, he said, well, you look at this plant, that's how it represents completeness to us. But you look at this plant, it only has three leaves. Then you look a little closer and you realize that each of those three leaves has, is divided into two. And so the six is there. And so he says, that plant, we call that it's all there because we think that plant is a plant that's there to teach us that if we look deeply enough within our own selves, we see that we too are complete beings. And that's what that plant is there to teach us. And I thought, that's what that plant is there to teach us? And I started looking around at the trees and the bushes around me saying, what are those plants there to teach us? And you know, we're not really raised in a culture where every being that shares the earth with us is known and assumed to have a teaching or a lesson. But this kind of reminds us that it's all there. We can just, just squint our eyes or open our hearts. We might actually, actually be able to understand all that. So it's sort of amazing to me to think about what a, the lesson that a small little plant can, can taste, it can, can teach and it tastes so good too. All right, and there you got sassafras. I can remember my grandmother going up to me and when I was little and showing me, she said, you can tell sassafras because it has three kinds of leaves. Right there in the center of the picture, you can see it has a mitten-shaped leaf, has a three-fingered leaf, and a regular round ovalish leaf. And that's one of the ways you can tell sassafras. Now, sassafras has been long used as an original flavoring for root beer. And, um, and when you smell the roots, it smells just like root beer. You make a really good tea. The tea has been long used as a, as a traditional spring tonic. And then sort of this sort of controversy started up because, because in, the, um, in the late 60s, early 70s, when all of a sudden these health food stores that used to just sell bottles of pills started having these shelves full of herbs. And the government says, we don't know anything about these herbs. People are taking these things. We don't know anything about them. Let's, we got to test something. So they said, let's test sassafras. Everybody's heard of sassafras. So they sent it off to some scientists in, in, um, in Rutgers University and they were, they, were, they were biochemists and they extracted the oil from the sassafras and then they extracted a compound from the oil called saffrol. They fed the saffrol to rats and the rats developed liver cancer. And they said, this stuff is carcinogenic. This stuff, sassafras is dangerous. And they made it illegal to sell for food or beverage purposes. And, uh, and so here I am, you know, kind of this young herb guy, just trying to be interested in, the, in how, the, how the natural world can serve us. And here's this plant that's been traditionally used for centuries 
How do I evaluate that? I don't want to think anything is Christ carcinogenic. Well, James Duke to the rescue. James Duke was a was an ethnobotanist. Basically, he worked for the Department of Agriculture, and um, and he was he was also an herb freak. He also liked plants. And his ninety year old grandmother down in the Piedmont of North Carolina was drinking sassafras tea every day, and um, and at least in the springtime. And uh, so he says, let's 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 do some relative carcinogenicity. Let's start with spring water is zero, and then try to compare things. And he found out that a can of beer is 10 times more carcinogenic than a cup of sassafras tea. And that's just for the ethanol, the alcohol content. And so, so, I, so I think what that kind of reminds us is that, is that um, a little moderation, I don't drink gallons of sassafras tea every day, but a little sassafras tea is probably good for you and might even, might even stimulate the liver. Um, so, all right. all right. And then let's see, now you probably heard this song. Jambalaya, crawfish pie, fillet gumbo. Some of gum will have big fun on the bio. <laughs> well, well, that's a song about did Jimmy Rogers, or uh, let's see. Uh, anyhow, a song about, about Cajun country. And, about, and there's a recipe right there talking about gumbo. And you know, there's, there's two kinds of gumbo, basically. Gumbo is sort of a, a soup. It's a way of stretching proteins. And there's two basic recipes. And one of them is, with, with okra to make it sort of thicken it up. And the other is with filet. I can remember one time going into a little little cafe in Cajun country down in Louisiana. And uh, I ordered a bowl of gumbo and there on the counter, there was salt and pepper shaker. And there was another shaker with some green stuff in it. And right when, when, the, when the waitress came in, she said, now honey, you put some of this filet on there and that'll make it thicken it up good. And I shook some on there. She shook it on my soup. And sure enough, it kind of thickened it up. Well, that filet, the gumbo filet, is nothing more than powdered sassafras leaves. And it actually has a sort of mucilage in it. And it's something the Cajuns had learned from the Native Americans, because sassafras is a Native American plant. In fact, look, I just, there you go, it's the gumbo filet. And if you can look at the, look at the, uh, at the, look at the ingredients there, it says sassafras leaves is the ingredient. Oh, can you use that point that works? Maybe. Um, all right, now here's a plant. It's kind of interesting. This is called poke, poke weed or poke salad. And um, well, I can remember one time I was talking to, to one of these back to landers of my generation. He, he, we moved back to West, West, West Virginia. And one of our neighbors showed us, he said, pointed this plant, says, that's poke salad. You can eat that. He said, well, we took that, we took that poke. We made a big old toss salad out of it. We ate that. And we were throwing up for days. <laughs> But what he didn't hear was that the old timer was saying poke salad, not salad, S-A-L-L-E-T. And salad is an old word meaning a cooked green. And pokeweed is edible, but it's interesting because pokeweed is listed as edible, it's listed as poisonous, and it's also listed as medicinal, which kind of reminds us in some ways that the difference between food, medicine, and poison sometimes, sometimes is, is just a matter of dosage. Well, when, when poke is considered to be edible, it's in the spring of the year, Oh, let's see if I'm going. Can you make it go? Spring of the year when it just first comes up out of the ground, and um, and you take the you take the poke. In the traditional recipe is you take the poke weed and you mm -hmm. boil it in, in some water, throw the water off, boil it in three different changes of water. Now a lot of us we're kind of like health food freaks, and we know that we cook herb greens and different kinds of greens. A lot of times, what we want to do is save those uh, that juice. That's the pot liquor. And it has a lot of the nutrients in it. But in the case of pokeweed, pokeweed does have some toxins in it. And this is one of the ways to dispel the toxins. And, um, and, and you know, um, the, the great, the great um, swamp rocker, Tony Joe White, um, in the early 60s, well, he, he was raised in, in North Louisiana and he was a sharecropper's son. And, um, and they, lived, they lived kind of back in the country and there was a family lived down the road from them it was pretty dysfunctional and they were pretty much held together by their, by their family, by, by this one teenage girl. And she would come around and, and they'd let her go and gather the pokeweed from around the edge of their garden plot. And she took it back and just from the food that she foraged, she was actually able to, able to kind of keep their family together. And he wrote a song about it. And the song actually hit the top 40s. It was actually covered by Elvis Presley. And actually I've covered a little version of it here myself. And, um, 
And so I thought maybe we'd just do a little version of it here just to get this to kind of hear about it here. It goes something like this. <laughs> Folk salad, Annie. <laughs> Gator got your granny. <laughs> Everybody thought it was a shame, but her mama was a working on the chain gang. Me and Vicious Woman now. <laughs> We're talking about high southern culture here, right? <laughs> Down in Louisiana where the alligators grow so mean. She lives a girl, I swear to the world, she makes them alligators look tame. Polk salad, Annie. Gator got your granny. Everybody thought it was a shame, but her mama was a working on the chain gang, mean fierce woman now. <laughs> Every evening about supper time, and he come down to my truck patch, pick herself a mess of poke salad, carried on home in the toe sack. Poke salad, Annie. <laughs> Gator got your granny. <laughs> Everybody thought it was a shame, but her mama was a working on the chain gang. Me and this woman now. <laughs> There's another verse about her no count brothers and all like that, but basically there we got 20th century ethnobotany, you know, a folk song about, about a plant. All right, let's see. Yeah, you can see here's actually some commercial, commercial greens. And you see that see the, the ones on the top, they both call it poke salad. But you see the one down at the bottom, they call it salad, which is really what it is. It's really a salad. And uh, it's like a keep my keep my vocal cords. All right, let's see what else we got here. Oh, and here's here's a plant that's kind of kind of fun. This is called lamb's quarters, and um, lamb's quarters, Kenopodium album. At least that's the one on the left. And lamb's quarters is one of the highest natural sources of, of uh, vitamin A, and in almost in almost any rich garden, it'll come, it'll it'll sprout. A lot of times, a lot of times you don't even have to plant it. It's just the seeds are just there in the ground, and if the soil's rich, it'll produce. And then lately, or a few years ago, we we found some some lamb's quarters that was purple in the center, the one on the right, and we thought it basically was just a color variation. It turned out it's actually a different species. It's called it's called Kenopodium giganteum because it really will grow like six or eight feet tall, and um, and and sometimes now in the garden catalogs you can see the seeds are actually sold. It's called magenta spring, and. Um, and uh, it's 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 a delicious green. It does have some some calcium oxalate in it, so it might be best to throw off the water the first time you cook it. All right, now here's here's some bark baskets, and, and this is a little sideline of mine. And I learned how to make bark baskets from an old mountain man. And I, I was visiting him one time, and he said, "I saw these baskets hanging on his porch." And I said, "Paul." These things are beautiful. What's the story on these? He says, why, buddy, them's berry baskets. I said, berry baskets? He says, yeah, we make a loop on either side and tie a string around them. You can hang it around your neck and you can, you can pick them. You can, you can uh, use both hands to pick your berries. And uh, well, I got so interested in them. They were so beautiful. And so now I think right here, I'm gonna try to, try to, try to show you how, what I learned from him. Whoops, let's see. Oh yeah, there's, there's a larger picture. So this, this, will, this will show you a little better here. So what he said, he said, say you're out in the woods somewhere and you find the awfulest side of huckleberries or blackberries that you ever saw. Well, you're eating a bunch of those berries, but you'd like to take some home. Well, what are you gonna what are you gonna do if you don't have anything to carry them in? He said with a twinkle in his eye. <laughs> he said, he said, if you know how to make your bark basket, what you do is you find you a little poplar tree, little tulip poplar tree. Let's see how I'm back here and make this so you can see it. Little tulip poplar tree. And what you do is you cut around it on the top and the bottom. And then you then then if it's during the growing season, you can actually peel the bark off the tree. And then you take take your pocket knife and you score sort of like a sort of like a football shape on the bottom. And 
And it gives you a place you can fold it. And you can fold the basket up. And there you got a basket. You can carry them berries home. I was so impressed, you know, and I thought, who invented these baskets? Well, of course, Native Americans have been making these baskets. And, um, and it's sort of interesting, the form is the same, but the materials are different. Like you can go into the Northwest and they might use cedar bark. You go in the Northeast, they might use elm or ash bark, basswood bark. You go in the high desert, they might use juniper bark. Turns out these baskets are made not only in North America, but all over the world. And um, I used to often will do this demonstration, do it for school kids. And, um, and it kind of reminds us in some ways that, that um, if you go back in all of our families, no matter how far you went back, you went back far enough, they're all doing the same thing. They're all making baskets, whether they're in Africa, Asia, South America, or North America. And um, they're all making baskets. And so it kind of reminds us in some ways that we're all one big human family. And you know, I was, I, was, um, I was doing this demonstration in a school class one time and one of the little kids says, one little boy about fifth grader raised up hand, Mr. Elliot, Mr. Elliot, I see bark baskets. I see baskets like that all the time. I said, you do? You see baskets? Are your parents basket makers? He said, no, no, but I see baskets like that all the time. I said, where do you see baskets like that? He says, McDonald's. I said, McDonald's? He said, yeah, man, large French fries. Now, I don't go to McDonald's very much, but I went to McDonald's after school that day. And there it is. There it is. As old as your oldest ancestors, as modern as modern industrial design. The most efficient way to make a container out of a piece of flat material is this ancient yet modern design. And I look on the bottom of the box, you know what it says? The design of this box is a registered trademark of McDonald's Corporation. Don't you think they're a couple hundred thousand years too late on that? You know? Well, I hope I don't get sued for making these bark baskets, but, um, you know, it's a crazy world out there, but, you know, and sometimes, and sometimes people, well, some of you from Florida folks, you might wonder, well, we don't have many tulip poplars down in Florida. What do we, what can we use? Well, you can use some, um, I've seen baskets made out of mimosa bark and sweet gum bark, and you probably could even use the Florida basswood bark. And some people say, well, don't you kill the tree when you take the bark off like that? Didn't we all learn in school that if you girdle a tree, that um, you, you, you kill it. Well, you know, for years I would kind of say, well, yeah, you know, when I would just take that tree, make a run of baskets out of one tree and then chop it up and use it for firewood the next winter. And then all of a sudden I realized something that, that a lot of us environmentalists have trouble thinking about, but every logger knows when you cut down a hardwood tree, do you kill it? Well, a lot of times you don't. It puts up roots from the shoots and it makes, it makes a whole new tree. A lot of times you go in the woods, you'll see a multi-trunk tree it's probably because the, 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 scent, the first part of the tree was killed off and then it puts out the secondary shoots so it keeps on growing. So, all right, let's see. I'm gonna see if we can get back to the slideshow here. Let's see, share screen. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can get All right, let's see. I'm trying to get it to turn. There you go. All right, here's a little riddle. That's an old country riddle, it goes like this. White as snow, but snow it ain't. Green as grass, but grass it ain't. Red as blood, but blood it ain't. Black as coal, but coal it ain't. What is it? Well, can you guess what it could be? How about a blackberry? Let's get to the next slide. Whoops. There it is, white as snow, the blossom, right? White as snow, but snow it ain't. Green as grass, the little green berry forming, the green leaves forming. And then uh, then red is blood, but blood it ain't before it gets ripe, just before it gets ripe. And then there it is, black as coal. And um, and the blackberry, you know? So um, it's actually a little, a little ditty that goes about blackberries. It goes like this, an old country, country saying goes like this. A blackberry is red when it's green. How can that be? Well, when it's green, when it's green, it's not ripe. When it's not ripe, it's red, so it's red when it's green. I love that, you know. But it but it kind of it kind of um 
And so abruptly, I called my friend Carolyn Jones. She's a master of doggerel and a berry farmer. I said, hey, can you do anything with this? A blackberry, red one, is green. She called me back and said a little later, a blackberry, red one, is green. A blueberry is ripe when it's blue. But how can we know when we look down low, below, below if a dewberry don't or it do? So the dewberry is a little low-growing blackberry. And you know, they, um, they all, in, in a lot of areas, they talk about the blackberry winter. The blackberry winter is that cold snap that comes when the blackberries are in bloom. And um, so, you know, maybe you're getting ready to put your tomatoes out. And, you know, even in, even in Florida, as long as you get that one cold snap, and it usually comes, usually often will come when the blackberries are in bloom. So you think, do I put my, put my frost sensitive plants out yet? Well, you might just wait, just to get the weather to change a little bit. The blackberries are in bloom. You hear about a cold front coming in. You might just wait a couple more days and let that cold front blow through before you put your tomato plants out. And, um, and the, great, the great anthropologist, Margaret Mead, titled her autobiography, Blackberry Winter. And she wrote a little inv invocation in the front of the book that says, uh, it often said that blackberries aren't sweet unless frost has touched their bloom. And you know, I think she's speaking metaphorically, you know, when frost touches our bloom, we hope we get sweeter, you know, but, um, but, but you know, you talk to country folks, they'll say that's actually true. Like what happens is if the, if the frost comes when the blackberries are in bloom, it won't kill all the blossoms. It'll just kill some of them, the most vulnerable ones. And what, that, what that'll do is it'll thin the crops so the plant will have more energy to put in a fewer berries so the berries will be bigger and sweeter. So it's just kind of fun how it all turns around. And, and you know, I came, I gave him this talk here. I came to, I kind of wanted to boogie a little bit. And, and I thought maybe we could boogie that there's a song called the Blackberry Boogie. It goes something like this. Blackberry Boogie. Blackberry Boogie. Blackberry Boogie, I'll meet you in the middle of the patch. Along about sun up every day. Grab my basket, I'm on my way. I run down the road just laughing and kicking. Heading for the patch and do some blackberry picking. Fill my basket up to the top. Makes my lips go flippity flop, flippity flop. I hear a little voice and it sounds so sad. It says, don't pick me now because I ain't right, Dad. Blackberry boogie. Blackberry boogie. Blackberry boogie, I'll meet you in the middle of the patch. I went to see my gal, set my basket down. She says, hey there, baby, are you going to town? I said, uh-uh, honey, I'm going with a scratch. I'll meet you in a minute in the blackberry patch. She grabbed her basket, she jumped in and squealed. I'm heading for the bushes and she's hot on my heels. <laughs> well, I picked on one and she picked on the other. We met in the middle and she yells, oh, brother, blackberry boogie. Blackberry boogie. Blackberry boogie, I'll meet you in the middle of the patch. <laughs> well, going through the bush, walking hand in hand, picking blackberries just to beat the band. I grabbed her for a kiss. She said, turn me loose. Your lips are all blue from that blackberry juice. I said, come on, honey, now don't be coy. Don't you know I'm your blackberry picking boy? <laughs> Well, I kissed her once, she let out a sigh. She said, let's go to my house and bake a pie. Blackberry boogie. <laughs> Blackberry boogie. <laughs> Blackberry boogie, I'll meet you in the middle of the patch. <laughs> Blackberry boogie, I'll meet you in the middle of the patch. <laughs> Blackberry boogie, I'll... <laughs> so <laughs> that, song, that song was recorded by Tenny Serenity Ford probably more than 50 years ago. I think it's fun to be boogie to the same tune my grandparents might have been boogieing to. You know. So all right, let's see. What do we got here? Oh, it sort of reminds me of a Native American tale. This is actually the the, the site, the um the set for the um uh, of the Mohegans in, in North Carolina. And it reminds me of a Native American tale. It's sort of a sort of a uh so sort of a, a pan pan Native American story. Lots lots of tribes have various variations on this same story, and um, and I was talking to Lloyd Arne, a great a great Cherokee storyteller, and he says the story the story might have actually started here in the in the Appalachian Mountains among the Cherokee, but it's a story about a man and a woman who've been together. 
They've been together for a long time. And for some reason, they were having a hard time getting along. I mean, she didn't feel like he respected her. And he did respect her. And he did love her. But um, but somehow or another, I don't know, they, they just they just weren't, something was going wrong. And she got so mad one day, she just took off out of that lodge. She threw a couple of things in her pack basket. She didn't know where she was going. All she knew is she was out of there. She had a pain in her heart. She had a lump in her throat. And she was... She was she was so upset. She just down the trail she went and off, off she went. And he didn't know what to do. You know, she never just went going off and just left like that before. And so so he moped around the lodge for about half a day and and he realized that she hadn't come back. He better go find her. He better go find her. Now he was a good tracker. He could he could follow the most subtle animal signs and he had no trouble following her for her her tracks. He could tell by the way her heel landed in the ground that she was that she was stomping mad and how far apart her footprints were she was moving fast so he he jogged down the trail for a while trying to catch up with her and every time he'd see a set of her tracks he realized that he had not closed the distance between them he couldn't seem to close the distance between them so he sat down there in the trail and he prayed he had a conversation with the powers and he said you don't have to make her change her mind but could you just slow her down a little bit so i could talk to her and uh, and it seemed like maybe his prayers were being heard because as she was walking along the trail, the breezes in the trees just were whispering and whispering, kind of whispering her name. And then she didn't hear any trees. She was just so mad. She was just walking down that trail. She was so upset. And the birds began singing, singing harmonies and melodies like they never sang before. And they were actually calling out her name, but she wouldn't listen to the birds. She was just so upset. She was just walking down that trail. She was so, oh, she was so angry. And, and then flowers began bursting into bloom right beside the trail as she was walking by. But she didn't see any flowers. She looked straight at that trail leading out of there. She wasn't paying any attention to the flowers. She was just mad. She was just stomping down that trail. She was looking straight down the trail and all of a sudden, you know, she was gonna take special intervention. And sure enough, as she was looking down the trail, she saw something bright red caught her eye. She looked down and it was a berry. But it wasn't like any berry she'd ever seen before. She picked that berry, she sniffed it, smelled so good, she tasted it. Oh, fragrant, delicious, oh, sweet, tangy. Oh, she ate that berry. Oh, it was so good. She hadn't stopped to rest the whole time. Her throat was getting sore. She was getting kind of dry and she looked around. She saw a couple more berries. She ate those berries then she could, thought she couldn't see any more. And she looked, she was at the edge of this little clearing and out in that little meadow, there were all these, these berries. She started picking those berries, eating those berries, and that juice trickled down her throat, started to kind of melt that lump in her throat and soften that hard spot in her heart. And she, she heard the breezes whispering in the trees. It sounded so soothing and so sweet. And the birds were singing, calling out. Oh, they sound so good. And the flowers, just everywhere else. She looked up and there she saw her husband. As soon as she saw the expression on his face, she said, you ought to try these berries, they're pretty good. And they say it was a long time before they got out of that field. And when they did, they were, they were walking home hand in hand. And all along that trail where they'd never seen them before, they saw the, those berries. And ever since then, those are the berries that you find. They're the first berries to come on after the cold winter. And, uh, and they're still out there. And Native Americans call them heart berries because they're shaped like the human heart. And, uh, we call them strawberries because we plant them with straw. And, uh, and that's how the first strawberries came to be. This story is old as the people and as modern as today, isn't it? A little, uh, so for, for many years, I actually made my living as a traveling herbalist. And I had, I had a whole display. I would go to folk festivals and traditional music festivals. And in some ways that was my classical education because, because there'd be all these old timers and all, all traditional people that knew different lots about, about not only old music, but they also knew about, about, about folk life, about living, about living close to the land. So often that became my, my classical education because these people, anyone who had anything to say about herbs would come and talk to me. And they come and look at my herbs and ask questions and, 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 and invariably tell me things. Well, one time I was at a, at a big folk festival and uh, I got to meet Bessie Jones. Now, Bessie Jones was, was played with a group called the Georgia Sea Island Singers. And basically she would just bring whatever members of her family or her church congregation wanted to come. 
and she'd bring, bring them bring them to the, these folk festivals and we'd play just a tambourine all she played she played these old spiritual songs that would just just would just lay the audience low with the power of her, her voice and her singing and and the, the group that she'd be with and uh, and I remember one time I was there at my booth with all my herbs, and all of a sudden I hear these booming voice. You know, here's something I like. Yes, sir, I get all my medicine out the woods in the fields. Yes, sir, I ain't had no doctor medicine since 1943. And uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. And then the next thing you know, she's up here, up there, looking, looking at all my, all my plants, and getting, and what's this? What's this? And I was trying to talk to her about these plants, and of course, I had different names than she did for some of the same plants, and and. Uh, and uh, so, so I, I, got, I got talking to her. She lived on, on St. Simon's Island. And I asked her, I said, sometimes I get down in the deep south there. Can I come visit you sometime and we can talk more about plants? And she gave me her number and all that. And so sure enough, I came to visit her. And we were, when, we were, when we were standing out, out back of her yard, the edge of, edge of a green patch, there was this little plant, this plant that many of us know as horse nettle or bull nettle or or Solanum carolinianum. And as it, you can see, it's in, the, it's in the tomato family. It's like a tomato blossom, but it has these little thorns all over it. And I said, Bessie, wh what's that plant there? She said, oh, that's called tread softly. I said, what? She said, tread softly, tread softly. It's like as if you're barefooted, you want to tread softly around that because that plant has a lot of prickles in it. I said, can you do anything with that? She says, use it for, ba for babies when they're, when they're teething. Well, you know, I was in my 20s then. I didn't know anything about babies. And, she, you know, but because she told me that, it just stuck in my head. And many years later, I was at a primitive skills event, one of the, one of the Rabbit River Cane Rendezvous. And I got to meet Walker Calhoun. Walker Calhoun was a Cherokee elder. And uh, we were sitting at the edge of the clearing there, and there was that plant. I said, well, Walker, um, do you know what to do with that plant? Do you know that plant? What's that? Yeah, that's called, we call that bullweed, he said. The bullweed. I said, he said, yeah. I said, can you do anything with it? He said, yeah, for babies, for babies when they when they slobber. <laughs> well, well uh, I knew a little more about babies then. I knew that when the babies drool a lot, that's when they're teething. I thought, hold it. Now here's this African American woman years ago who told me about using it for babies when they're teething, and here he is telling me the same thing. A Cherokee elder. And I thought, well, Walker, how do you do it? He said, take these to the root and put it on a necklace around their neck. I said, do they chew on it? He said, no, might be poison. <laughs> well, well I, was, I was kind of amazed because it actually is in the Solanum family. And, you know, the Solanum family has lots of wonderful plants that we use every day. Tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, peppers. They're all in that family. But there's also a lot of, a lot of poisonous plants in that family, too, the jimson weed and and some other plants like that, and um, and so I thought, well, let me go. Let me go talk to some of the women and see, let's get the real story here. So I ended up talking to Gail Thrower. Gail Thrower was was a, an elder in the um, the Porch Creek tribe out of Alabama, and I asked her about that. And she says, "Oh, that's right." She says, "Yeah, the the, the older women told me about that." They, I said, "What do they call it?" They says, she says, "Well, they call it thread sass." I said, thread sash? You mean like sewing thread and sash like sassafras? She says, that's what it sounded like to me. And I said, well, how do they use it? She said, well, they put it on a little neck. They put, it, they put the little pieces of the root on a necklace and wear the necklace around their neck. They put it around the baby's neck. And, I said, and she said, tight enough so they can't get it in their mouth. And um, then I thought, now what's that all about? And I realized, okay, so could it be that this plant is a member of the, of the Solanaceae family, it has lots of, lots of strong alkaloids in it. And could it be that the babies, when they're teething a lot, the, the saliva drips down on the, on the little pieces of root, moistens the root, and a tiny amount of some kind of a sedative or a painkiller or some, some, something that makes the effect. Well, you know, in the old days, they used to give you Dramamine for seasickness. Now what they do, they give you something called a scope patch. You put it on your temple or behind your ear. And that's the scopalamine patch. Scopalamine is one of the ingredients that's in, that's in um, various members of the Solanum family. And, and it's transdermal. And so it could be that maybe that's how, how that remedy works. 
And I've had requests from it for, for that plant for this kind of thing. And I thought that name thread sass, that's strange. And then I was talking to this wonderful, wonderful South Carolina friend of mine, Jimmy Cooley. And Jimmy Cooley says, oh yeah, daddy always talked about that. He called it tread saft. Tread saft, saft is kind of an old timey country Appalachian way of saying soft. They kind of flatten the, flatten the all sounds of that. So really what he's calling it was, what she was saying was thread sass was her, her misunderstanding of tread saft. And tread saft is just like Bessie said, tread softly. So it just, it took me on an amazing journey to think about how these plants work medicinally. And I met, met a lot of interesting people talking about it. So I just thought you might enjoy hearing about that particular thing. Well, you know, while we're talking about that, the members of the plant family, here's, here's, here's one, of the, one of the more famous ones. This one is called Jimson weed. And it's in the member, it, or thorn apple, because you can see the seed pod. And, um, Actually, you know, this, this picture, this picture I, I caught just in the, it's, it's kind of a night bloomer. I caught it just in the, in the early evening, it just was blooming. Actually in North Florida, I took that picture. Eventually it ended up in the uh, Peterson Field Guide to Medicinal Plants. So it's just kind of fun how you never know where, where, where these pictures will end up. And um, so, so a little more on that Jimson weed story goes something like this. This is, this is uh, Robert Beverly's History of Virginia. It was written in 1705. And what he reported on was some soldiers were there to quell Bacon's Rebellion in the Jamestown colony. And they didn't have meals ready to eat like they do these days. And these guys were kind of hungry. And there were some greens going around the edge of the garden, edge of the, edge of the, of the pasture. And they got these greens and they cooked them up. And this is what Robert Bedley reported. This being an early plant, they got it very young for a boiled salad, right? Like some of the soldiers sent hither, some of them eat plentifully of it, the effect of which was a very pleasant comedy, for they turned natural fools upon it for several days. One would blow up a feather in the air, another would dart straws at it with much fury. Another stark naked was sitting in the corner like a monkey grinning. A fourth would fondly kiss and paw its companions and sneer in their faces. In this frantic condition, they were confined lest they should in their folly destroy themselves. So it was observed that all their actions were full of innocence and good nature. Indeed, they were not very cleanly, for they would have wallowed in their own excrements if they had not been prevented. A thousand such simple tricks they played, and after 11 days returned to themselves again, not remembering anything that had passed. So there you go. That's the first recorded psychedelic trip taken by, by Europeans in North America. And ever since that, they call that plant Jamestown weed. And now that's been corrupted. Now we call it Jimson weed. That's how it got the name. So it's kind of, a, as you can see, kind of a dangerous plant. 11 days, those guys were out of it. And, uh, they, and I don't recommend anyone fool with it in terms of anything taken internally because, because um, there have been fatalities associated with just that kind of foolishness. So those guys were lucky. They got away with unscathed. So let's see. Well, let's see. We're getting towards the end of this little program here. Let's see. I, you, you, see, you saw my, my, my herb setup. And I used to travel around this Volkswagen bus with this, with this canoe on top, so I could, I could pop the canoe into any swamp or, or river that I wanted. And I was traveling around studying plants, and, and I, was heading, I was heading down to Louisiana, and I was heading out of Georgia, and I got the Alabama welcome. Yes, sir, son. You got any, got any, any illegal drugs or firearms on you? I said, no, sir. Mind if we look? Well, yes, sir, you can look, but I'll tell you, there's nothing illegal in here. And uh, so the next thing you know, they saw my whole collection of all these herbs, and I just kept giving them the Latin names. And they said, what's this, what's this, what's this? And they knew that all. And, and, uh, and eventually they kind of realized that I really was just studying. I had a big pile of botany books in the front, the front of the van. And, um, and so probably, you know, we've gone on for quite a while here this morning. Probably what I could do is say, the end. So, so, so thank you all for being a part of this thing. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something.